topic today is Apocalypse Now, exploring the amazing prophecies of the book of Revelation, prophecies that talk about our day. But firstly, it's my privilege to introduce to you my wife, Beverly. Happy Sabbath. A couple of months ago, I heard on the radio about some lawyers getting together, and I think it was in New York, and they were creating a firm for the defense of animal rights. Well, straight away I could see the headlines. Mr. Brown loses house to dog over neglect case. He neglected to give the dog the correct brand of food. Or, farmer loses farm when animals sue because Mr. Farmer brought the cows in too early to the barn to be milked. Now don't get me wrong, I grew up on a dairy farm and I've worked on a ranch, so I really do love animals of any kind. But to me this sounded as if it could become quite ridiculous until a couple of weeks ago when something happened to change my mind. On our way home from Ukraine, we had a stopover in Amsterdam where I picked up the local newspaper and read this. The picture of black and white Frisian cows dotting the Dutch countryside is fast becoming a thing of the past. It is now estimated that 150,000 Dutch cows, or 8% of the total herd, are kept permanently indoors. And over the next five years, this number will increase. Now, being a farmer's daughter, I know that cows do not like to be locked up day and night. You just ask one. <laughs> Why are they doing it? For the simple reason, more profits. You see, if they lock them up day and night, fill them up with hormones and other things, they can milk them three times a day instead of twice a day. It's bad enough that we've locked up most of our chickens and our vealers. And now they're going to add the poor old dairy cow. Many people seem to have forgotten that God expects us to look after the animals in this beautiful world he has given us. In Revelation 11, verse 18, there's a very interesting text that says, God will destroy those who destroy the earth. And I believe this not only means the earth, but every living thing upon it. This strong text in Revelation 11 reveals to us in no uncertain terms how God feels about those who pollute the air, the water, the soil, and about their cruelty to animals. The trees in the forests are the lungs of the earth, and yet mankind is thoughtlessly cutting them down. And as we all know, without them, we will die. Most of the waterways are polluted, as is our air. Now, there's a joke in Los Angeles that goes, we won't breathe any air we can't see. And quite often that's true, we can see it. In some parts of the world, the soil has been polluted, either by poisonous chemicals or nuclear waste. Most governments do not realize how God, the great creator, looks on all of this. They seem to be ignorant of the fact that we humans are God's caretakers. Which brings us to the question, what can you and I do? Number one, if we are ever in a position of influence, let's speak up for the safety of the earth and every living thing on it. Number two, we all need to do what we can in our little corner of the world. Don't pollute, don't litter, recycle, etc. Let's look after our animals and encourage others to do the same. If we have a backyard or some land, let's plant trees and shrubs and flowers. And if you work in an office like I do where you cannot open the window, get one of these beautiful peace lily plants. They are one of the best plants to absorb the air pollutants. Plus, they are extremely easy to look after. They just need a drink of water a couple of times a week and they are happy as a lark. 
And so, boys and girls, young people and other dear friends, may God help us to be faithful stewards and caretakers of this beautiful and wonderful world. I have here a copy of Time magazine. It's one of the most recent copies. It's entitled The Bible and the Apocalypse. Of course, the word apocalypse means a revelation. It comes from the Greek word to reveal. A tremendous number of people today are interested in the last days because millions of people across this country believe that's where we're living. Uh, Time magazine has this to say. The biggest book of the summer is about the end of the world. It's also a sign of our troubled times. What do you watch for when you're watching the news? Signs that interest rates might be climbing. Maybe it's time to refinance. Signs of global warming. Maybe forget the new SUV. Signs of a new terrorist activity. Maybe think twice about that flight to Chicago. Or signs that the world may be coming to an end. And the last battle between good and evil is about to unfold. Sort of amazing, isn't it? In a secular magazine like Time Magazine, which is hardly a, a spokesperson for the Christian church. It says, a Time CNN poll finds that more than one third of Americans say they are paying more attention now to how the news might relate to the end of the world and have talked about what the Bible has to say on the subject. Fully 59% say they believe the events in Revelation are going to come true, and nearly one quarter think the Bible predicted the September 11 attack. Some of that interest is fueled by faith, some by fear, some by imagination. But all three are fed by the left behind series. Have you seen the Left Behind series? The books offer readers a vivid, violent, and utterly detailed description of just what happens to those who are left behind on the earth to fight the Antichrist after Jesus returns or lifts the faithful up to heaven. At the start of book one, on a 747 bound for Heathrow from Chicago, the flight attendants suddenly find about half the seats empty, except for the clothes and wedding rings and dental fillings of the believers who have suddenly been swept up to heaven. Down on the ground, cars are crashing, husbands are waking up to find only a nightgown in bed next to them, and all children under 12 have disappeared as well. Where do they get this from? The next nine books chronicle the tribulation suffered by those left behind and their struggles to be saved. The series has sold some 32 million copies. 50 million if you count the graphic novels and children's versions. And sales jumped to 60% after September 11. Book nine, published in October, was the best-selling novel of 2001. Evangelical pastors promote the books as devotional reading. Mainline pastors read them to find out what their congregations are thinking, as do politicians and scholars and people whose job it is to know what fears and hopes are settling in the back of people's minds in a time of deep uncertainty. Now the tenth book, The Remnant, is arriving in stores. A breathtaking 2.75 million hardcover copies and its impact may be felt far beyond the book clubs and the Bible classes. To some evangelical readers, the left behind books provide more than a spiritual guide. They are a political agenda. When they read in the papers about the growing threat to Israel, they are not only concerned for a fellow democratic ally, in the war against terror, they are also worried about God's chosen people and the fate of the land where events must unfold in a specific way for Jesus to return. That combination helps explain why some Christian leaders have not only bonded with Jews this winter as rarely before, 
but have also pressed their case in the Bush White House as if their salvation depended on it. Today, we're going to have a look at the great themes of the book of Revelation. There's something I want to say to you, and it is a word of kindly warning to every person in the church today and every person watching the telecast. The Bible teaches that we are involved in a great controversy between two great princes, the prince of light and the prince of darkness. The Bible tells us that the earth is the battlefield. And when a person studies history and contemporary theology, it is apparent that every truth of the Bible concerning the second coming the Antichrist, the Great Tribulation, the deliverance of God's people, the destruction of evil, every truth has been counterfeited. And today we are here to expose the counterfeit, to counter the counterfeit. Please take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation, would you? Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 9. Revelation, the 12th chapter. Please take your Bibles and notice this, Revelation chapter 12, and verses 7 to 9. The Bible says, And there was war in heaven. Michael, another name for Jesus, and his angels fought against the dragon, that's the devil, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, what does it say? Who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. This world has become the battlefield. And today as we explore the teachings, the book of Revelation, I want you to make sure that your faith is built not upon some videotape, some movie, or some book, but upon the words of Holy Scripture. Every truth has been counterfeited by the Antichrist. What are the great themes of Revelation? Today, by the grace of God, in the next few moments, I'm going to give you a summary of the entire book and the great themes. A great theme of the book of Revelation is the second coming called by some the rapture. Where do you read the word rapture in the Bible? You don't. The second coming, the rapture, the judgment day. Would you please come over here to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 to the first chapter of the apocalypse. As today we explore the theme of this great book. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Please turn in your Bibles. Bring your Bibles to church. Don't be like some congregations that sit there and are brainwashed by their pastors because they don't read their Bibles. Revelation 1 verse 7, the Bible says, look, he is coming with the clouds. What does it say? Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be, amen. That doesn't seem to my way of thinking to be a secret rapture. The Bible talks about Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. Jesus said that he would come like the lightning and every single person, good and bad alike, will see him when he comes. Many preachers teach that when Jesus comes, he doesn't come in glory and power, but he comes in secret. I believe, and I say this to you with great courtesy, I believe that the idea that Jesus comes in secret and the saints are raptured home to glory, then there is a seven-year time period when the Antichrist rules and a Jewish remnant at last are found upon the earth. I believe that this idea is simply a 
myth. And is a truth? No, it is not a truth. It is a counterfeit of the truth. The Bible says he comes with the clouds. Would you turn to Revelation chapter 6 because here it describes the rapture. And we shall use that term because it is understood by many people. Revelation chapter 6 verses 12 and onwards. Listen to this. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island were removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? When Jesus comes, it is the most momentous, the most audible, the most visible, the most, most earth-shaking event in the history of the human race. The rapture is anything but something which is secret and silent. And when Jesus comes, the Bible says he's coming when he returns to this earth, he's coming upon sinners in the world and in the church. Let us not think because we are employed by the church and hold positions of trust and lord it over others that we are going to be safe from the coming judgments of Christ when he returns. He's coming in judgment upon those who practice greed. I'm amazed at the greed that executives can pay themselves hundreds of millions and then go down to Florida or to Beverly Hills and build a home worth a hundred million dollars when their employees are thrown out in the cold and lose everything they had of their savings. God is going to come in judgment upon those greedy CEOs. They may escape the law courts and Congress, but they will not escape the wrath of the Lamb. He's coming upon, in judgment upon liars. In North America, we have elevated lying to a dignified art form. Most people tell lies. The Bible tells us he's coming in judgment and fire and wrath upon all liars. The liars, the violent people, the child molesters. How people say these people are sick. I say they're not sick, they're evil. Let us not make it so that there's an excuse for them. They are evil. He's coming in judgment upon the porno kings. He's coming in judgment upon the hypocrites in the church, the hypocrites in the pews, and the hypocrites in the pulpits. He's coming in judgment. And men will cry to the rocks and the mountains, and the Bible says he is coming to deliver his people, his remnant. Look at Revelation 7, 13 and onwards. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 13 and onwards. Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 and onwards. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who've come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in the temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger and never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. He comes and he saves his remnant, his people 
who have gone through the great tribulation. And where do people get the stuff that is mesmerizing and deceiving hundreds of millions of people, not here, out of fertile imaginations? He is coming to save and deliver his people. Many, many years ago, William Miller was accosted by a scuffer after the great disappointment and the man said to him, oh, Mr. Miller, I see you are still in the land of the living. No, sir, he said, I'm in the land of the dying, but when Jesus comes, I'm going to the land of the living. Amen. We are living in the land of the dying, but Jesus is coming back in power and great glory to judge the hypocrites and destroy the wicked and to save his remnant, his people. Theme number one, the second coming and the rapture. Number two, the end of the world and the depopulation of the earth. It is believed by millions of people who have been deceived that after Jesus comes, millions of people are going to be on the earth being deceived by the Antichrist. The Bible tells me after Jesus comes, there's nothing left on the earth except rotting corpses because the saints are home in glory. He takes them home to glory, but the earth is destroyed when Jesus comes. Would you come over here to Revelation 16 and verse 16 and onwards? Revelation chapter 16, I want you to have your faith in the Bible. I want to say to those who are watching this telecast today, please be frank and honest with me and be frank and honest with yourself. Are you getting your theology from audio cassettes? Are you getting your theology from movies? Are you getting your theology from mass manipulation in a church? We need to get our theology from the Word of God. And if you've got a church and you've got a preacher who preaches from the Bible and tells you to read your Bible every day, you ought to say, thank God and be grateful. Because it's becoming a rare thing. We are living in a time of brainwashing, religious brainwashing. Verse 15 says, Behold, I come like a thief. That's the coming of Jesus. Verse 17, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne saying, It is done. That's the end. That's when Jesus comes. Then there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell up upon men and they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. And we're told in the prophecies of Jeremiah and the book of Revelation is based upon the prophecies of the Old Testament and the teachings of Jesus, particularly Matthew 24. The Bible says that there's, there's going to be no person on the earth. Jeremiah says, I looked and there was no man. Even the birds of the heavens had fled. There's nobody on the earth because the saints are home in glory and the wicked have been destroyed. If you're left behind, you're not going to be doing battle with the Antichrist because the Antichrist is going to be dead and you're going to be dead too. Amen. The Bible says the Antichrist is destroyed when Jesus comes. Look at Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. The Bible is plain about this, friend. In fact, they asked one of the authors of one of those books, one of those movies left behind, uh, do you really believe this stuff? And he said, well, you know, it's a story and it sells a lot of stuff. It sells a lot of stuff. People send a lot of money into the television ministry, you know, gets them all worked out. No, we don't really believe it all, but, you know, it's interesting. Revelation 20, verse 1 and onwards. And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss. 
That's this earth when it's completely destroyed. Holding in his hand a great chain, he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil of Satan, bound him for a thousand years. The millennium starts when Jesus comes. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. The Bible says when Jesus comes, the earth is turned into an abyss. Just an empty, howling wilderness, and the only people, if you can call them people, are the devil and his angels. But the saints are home in glory and the Antichrist has been destroyed. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the lawless one, listen to me, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the lawless one, the man of sin, the Antichrist, is destroyed by the brightness of his coming. That's what it says. And so when Jesus comes, when the rapture occurs, when the saints are raptured home to glory, the Antichrist is destroyed. And the question we ought to ask ourselves is this, are we ready for the coming of Jesus? Now these people are right when they say we're living in the last days. They're right. Millions of Americans believe that we're living in the last days. They're right. But the question is, are we ready for the coming of Jesus? Heresy, error, is never harmless because it perverts and twists the soul. Another great theme in the book of Revelation is the rule of Antichrist. Now the book left behind and other books like it teach that when Jesus comes, there's a seven-year period during which time the Antichrist rules. They say, where do they get that from? Certainly not from the Bible. In Daniel chapter 9, you've got the 70 weeks. Then you've got the last week. And what they do, they take the 69 weeks that finish when Jesus came the first time. And then they drop in there a couple of thousand years or more. And then they have the last seven years. Now you say, what authority have you got to drop 2,000 years in that? They say, well, do you need authority? Do you need authority? But the Bible doesn't teach it well, but it sure sells a lot of videos. It reminds one of the sign they put up over the old blacksmith store. And I'm not saying this to offend anybody. I want to believe the truth. I want to preach the truth. I want to be faithful to God. I don't want to be deceived. Do you? But if you're looking at a lot of videos and if you're not studying your Bible, you're getting brainwashed, absolutely brainwashed. You're getting deceived. It reminds one of the sign over the old blacksmith store a hundred years ago. The words were, all kinds of twistings and turnings done here. That happens today in the world of theology. Now they teach that the Antichrist rules after the second coming and after the great tribulation, that is a myth because the Antichrist is destroyed when Jesus comes. You see, it's a great idea. It's very comforting. I wish it were true because they say, well, the church is not going to go through, the, through this great tribulation. We're going to be home in glory. Boy, that's nice, isn't it? Isn't that comforting? Isn't that sweet? It certainly appeals to people who don't like to fight the good fight of faith. But the Bible tells me that the saints of God go through the great tribulation. And they say, you don't have to worry about being deceived by the Antichrist because you're not going to be here. You don't have to worry about getting the mark of the beast because you're not going to be here. But the Bible teaches that the saints of God must confront the Antichrist and reject the mark of of the beast before the rapture. Come over here to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13, verse 1, And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. This is the famous Antichrist. The Bible says, verse 5, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. 
And verse 16, he also forced everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. What was the teaching of the Lutheran church? about the Antichrist? What was the teaching of the Methodist Church? What was the teaching of the Episcopalian Church, the Church of England? What was the teaching of the Presbyterian Church? What was the teaching of the great Reformed Churches? The Reformed Churches taught that the Antichrist was destroyed when Jesus came, returned, and that the Antichrist is the great church of the dark ages with its headquarters in the city of Rome. That is what the church is taught. If something is new, it is seldom true. And if it is true, it is seldom new. The idea that the Antichrist is a power that arises after the second coming of Christ is not taught in the Bible. Hundreds of years ago, after the Great Reformation, there were two Jesuit priests. Two Jesuit priests. And these priests were determined to destroy the prophecies of the Bible that unmasked the man of sin. If you have a King James Version Bible sometime when you're home, open it to the preface and read there what the translators of the King James Version said about the Antichrist. Exactly what I'm saying today. And the two Jesuit priests to take the spotlight of Bible prophecy off the man of sin devised preterism and futurism. Preter, preterism said everything in the book of Revelation concerns the days in which the book of Revelation was written and the Antichrist is Nero or one of the other emperors. And futurism said the Antichrist is not here yet. The Antichrist is going to come right at the very end of the world. But my friends who write books like Left Behind, and I'm sure they're very earnest, good people. But my friends have done one even better than the futurists. They do not even have the Antichrist in the last days. They have the Antichrist after the last days. But the Bible tells me that the mark of the beast is the mark of the apostate church. And this becomes the test for the people of God. The church of God is not going to be raptured home and escape the tribulation. The church of God is going to endure the tribulation and stand firm for Christ. They are the characteristics of the remnant. Have you seen those cartoons? You see them in religious books of people running around with 666 stamped on their heads. Have you seen those? They are cartoons. Antichrist is here now. The mark of the beast becomes a test before the second coming. The great test is coming to the church on the earth. The truth of the remnant. It is taught by some of these wonderful, good people. I say that sincerely. I believe that many of them are very, very sincere. And I have nothing against them personally, only against the heresy that they are teaching and the delusion that they're bringing upon millions and millions of gullible people. They teach that the remnant is composed of a group of Jewish survivors after the second coming. And they say Revelation 12, 17 points to a group of Jewish survivors who become Christians. Revelation 12, 17 says... Then the dragon, the devil, was enraged at the woman, the church, and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring or the remnant, those who obey God's commandments 
and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Would you please notice that these people are people who love Jesus? The remnant is composed of people who are washed by the blood of Jesus. You get that? Now listen to this very carefully. What I'm going to tell you now was believed once by virtually every American Christian, every Christian in the world. Listen to this. The Bible says that while in the Old Testament God had a chosen nation, the Israel of the flesh, because of the failure of the Israel of the flesh to accept the Messiah, and because they crucified him. The kingdom of God has been taken from the Israel of the flesh and given to the Israel of the spirit. Please listen and hang on these words. Come to Matthew 21, to the words of Jesus. And much of Revelation is built upon the prophecies of Matthew, particularly Matthew 24, the little apocalypse it is called. Matthew chapter 21. And Jesus is talking here to the leaders of the Jews. He says, verse 43, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruits. Listen to me. Look at me. Would you like to know who the remnant are? Would you like to know who the chosen are? The Bible says, God says in the book of Galatians through Paul, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In the book of Romans, it says he is not a Jew who was one outwardly, but he is a Jew who was one inwardly. Paul goes on to say in Romans, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but it is the children of the promise who are counted for the seed. Listen carefully to this. Who is Israel? Every Jew who accepts Jesus, every Muslim who accepts Jesus and is born again, Every American who accepts Jesus and is born again. Every Russian who accepts Jesus and is born again. Every Australian who accepts Jesus and is born again. When a person comes to Jesus, he becomes a child of the promise and he is an Israelite. That's what the Bible teaches. This idea that is taught in these books like Left Behind is a denial of the cross of Jesus. Israel in the Middle East is no longer in prophecy. People say, but it's one of the great signs of the second coming. No, it is not. It's not a sign at all. Israel in the Middle East is no longer mentioned in the prophecies of the Bible. Every nation... Jews who believe in Jesus, Americans who believe in Jesus, Russians, Australians, Englishmen, Frenchmen, if you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed, is the teaching of the Bible. You see, the good news is God is not a racist. I've heard some people say who were hyper-nationalistic in this country. Ah, we are the special people of God. We are a Christian country. We are the children. No, no. God has got his children everywhere. Black people, white people, brown people, red people. If you belong to Christ, then you are a child of God. I want to belong to the remnant of God, do you not? Amen. Now, Another great truth is the truth about the great tribulation. Look at Revelation 16. It describes it in detail. People say, well, we're not going to be here. Yes, you will. 
Revelation 16, verse 1 and onwards, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went out and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and, be, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man and every living thing in the sea died. But then you come to verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat. This is real global warming. Maybe this is where it's going to take us. They were seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. No wonder that kingdom has brought darkness to the world. God is going to give that kingdom a taste of literal darkness. And verse 15, behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake. Verse 16, then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. This takes place, my beloved friends, in this church and those in television land. This takes place before the rapture. And God is going to come and stand with his people in the furnace. These are the judgments of of God upon a world that has despised salvation, rejected the gospel, and crucified Jesus. Abraham Lincoln said, God is just, and justice cannot sleep forever. I say, get ready. We may flout the law of God, and scorn the church, and break the commandments of God and live petty, little, sordid, lying lives of greed and think we're going to be raptured home to glory. That is the great deception. The Lord will come in justice upon Wall Street and the rest of the world that has despised his law. The church endures and survives the time of trouble. A major theme, perhaps the major theme of Revelation is salvation through the Lamb. The term the Lamb is mentioned in the book of Revelation 28 times. 28 times, the Lamb. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. The very opening words of Revelation chapter 1. Verses 4 and 5, salvation through the Lamb. To the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before the throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. The great teaching of the book of Revelation is salvation through the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb. Listen to this politically incorrect statement. Not all religions are equal. Oh, but everybody is equal. Everybody is equal, but not all religions are equal. All religions have the right to preach, teach, and own property, at least in America and Australia, and Great Britain and some other countries. Certainly not in Saudi Arabia or some other countries. All religions have the right to preach and teach. But not all religions are equal as far as salvation is concerned. Salvation is found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. John, who wrote the book of Revelation, quoted Jesus when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We are not saved through faith in heathenism or paganism. We are not saved by faith in Moses. We are not saved by faith in Buddha or Gandhi or any good person. 
We are saved by faith alone in the Son of God, the Lamb who died for our sins. And the truth that keeps me going when I feel like giving up is this great truth of Revelation. Everything is going to be okay for the child of God. Because I've read the back of the book. It's going to be okay for two reasons. Firstly, Jesus is Lord. Look at Revelation 1, 13 and onwards. I have some dear friends who are here today who are going through a hard time with a lawsuit. Some people are trying to destroy them. I want to say to them today, they're not in charge. Jesus is the Lord. Amen. Jesus is the Lord. Don't be discouraged by the works of evildoers. Verse 12 and onwards, Revelation 1. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. That's judgment. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of hell and the grave. Jesus is Lord. It doesn't matter what people try to do to you or what the Antichrist does to you or what the government does to you or an apostate church does to you. Jesus is still the Lord. He will have the last say. And it's going to be okay for the true remnant of God because Jesus is preparing a place for his redeemed. Isn't that good? Look at Revelation chapter 21. Jesus is preparing a home for his redeemed. Revelation chapter 21, that ought to make you want to shout for glory. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 and onwards. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will, drink, I will give to drink without cost from the springs of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. It's going to be okay for the child of God. No more sin, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more heartache, no more tears, no terrorists, no crooked CEOs robbing the common people of their homes. No criminals, no child molesters, no antichrist, no law suits, no Satan, no death, and no end. Little wonder that John said in the closing words of the apocalypse, even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.
Amen. Please kneel. Let's pray. Now, Father, you've spoken to our hearts today. We've had a glimpse of glory as we've studied the book of Revelation. And we can see, our Father, that the end is coming. And when Jesus comes, what a day it's going to be. We like to think we're all going to be caught up and go home singing. And the truth of the matter is, if he came today, most of us would be burnt with fire and we'd be screaming in our sins. Dear Lord, help us to realize that the Lord is coming in wrath upon an apostate church, upon those people who carry out unlawful lawsuits, who steal, who lie, and who cheat, and who defraud, and who rob the poor, and who put down poor people. Come into our hearts today, our Father, and truly convert us, and take away our sins, and put your Spirit in our hearts. And help us, dear Father, to be a part of the remnant who truly keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus in their hearts. As we're praying here today with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, how many will say, Dear Lord, redeem my soul and revive me. Change me. Would you lift up your hand today? Dear Lord, redeem my soul. Stir me. Save me from deception. Shake me out of this this lazy spirituality that's so characteristic of Southern California, shake me out of it, Lord, and set me on fire for God and make me a, a new believer. Please lower your hands. That's most of you. Not all of you, but most of you. And the parents here who are here today, who will raise a hand and say, I will bring my children to Sabbath school and I will be a good parent. Would you raise your hands? The parents. You know something? I was scandalized to hear about that poor little kid who was stolen. You know that? You know what happened? Parents are divorced, and they leave the little child with some... What sort of parents are they? You know who's responsible? The parents. Weren't looking after that little girl. I'm not talking about the ones here in Southern California. I'm talking about this other little girl who was killed by a street person. Goodness. What were the parents doing? Parents, let us save our children. Let's raise our hands if we can say today, I want to save my children by my example. Can you lift your hands up? Can you lift up your hand and say, please today pray for my son and my daughter? If you can say that, help me to be a better parent. You can't go back 20 or 30 years, but you can start today. Please raise your hand if you want us to pray for your children today. Dear Father, bless the children. Bless the parents. Help us to realize we're in a great battle with the devil. And help us through the blood of Jesus to win the battle. Bless all the little babies in this church. Bless the dedicated parents that come long distance. Bless George and Carla, especially with the little Jessica. Bless Marcella as she leads the young people. Bless Daniel as he leads the youth. And bless those who are teaching the juniors and other groups in the church. Bless our Sabbath school teachers and, oh, God, come down today and change our gears and put us into top gear. Amen. Help, because some of us, Lord, have been in reverse. So help us to get out of reverse and to go ahead for the kingdom. Bless every up raised hand today. Now, those who would say today, I want my sins forgiven. I want to be washed by the blood of Jesus. Will you raise your hands? <laughs> put your hands up high. Some of you don't seem to think you got any sins. I'm getting up both of my hands. I have plenty. Put up your hands. I want my sins forgiven. Don't mess around with this today. And don't mess around with God today. And don't mess around with me. What say if you get in your car? It's not funny. So we should have no laughing. What say if you get in your car and you drive out today and you get killed by a semi-trailer? You're going to be laughing then, aren't you, when you wake up in fire? It's going to be funny, isn't it? If you want your sins under the blood of Jesus, would you raise your hands? And say, Lord, wash me in the blood of Jesus. Say that after me. Lord, wash me in the blood of Jesus. Help me to keep your commandments. Help me not to be a hypocrite. 
Help me to love Jesus and help me to read his Bible every day. So help me God, for Jesus' sake, amen.